get their honors from door to door in the shortest time possible. They're going to be traveling for at least 36 to 40 hours. They're always a little apprehensive. This is when the animals are going to be uh, at their most nervous with the, with the sounds of the aircraft and the the movement of the crates. A simple number, I think three tons of paint on all of these crates. Total trust, efficiency and proficiency is, is sort of totally above board. Moving so many rhinos at one time, this distance, it's a first. It really is conservation at scale. Finally, we're at Akagera National Park and we've managed to bring 30 rhinos here. This is the story of what is possible when we put things back the way nature intended. When we give nature a chance, the ultimate conservation goal can be achieved. The rewilding of new areas with species in dire need of sanctuary. But while 30 rhinos may have just arrived in Rwanda, this journey actually began 30 years ago when Pinda Private Game Reserve first came into being. Pinda as a, as a conservation story has been quite remarkable. It started off um, just as a small 7,500 hectare property while we were negotiating properties to the south and we eventually put together 17,000 hectares in the first few years. But the rewilding and the conservation successes of Pinda were the first reintroduction of cheetahs onto private land in KwaZulu-Natal, first adult elephants on private land in KwaZulu-Natal, the first time lion and cheetah had been reintroduced to the same property. The cheetah population has done so well that we've been able to repopulate many other reserves all over Africa. The lion population has done the same and we've been able to resupply other parks, including Akagera. So the lions from Pinda, the first international translocation of those lions was to Akagera as well. So the start of the relationship with African parks, which has been remarkable. And when we look at the elephant population and how that's grown and how much we've learned on elephant management at the Pinda operation, how to translocate elephants, picking elephants up by their feet. All these kind of um, activities had never happened before this operation took place. So the, the conservation contribution is way beyond the 30,000 hectares that now encompass Pinda 30 years later. You know, we started 30 years ago with about 30 rhinos. And over the years, we managed to grow that population to a, a population of global significance. Uh, we've managed to secure them. And so we have, we believe, enough rhinos to move 30 out of that population to have no uh, impact on the remaining animals. 
Um, it's a wonderful story for uh, uh, Pinda, the, the return. Um, I had the privilege of being involved in introducing the animals to Pinda in its inception. So these animals are animals that I introduced here 30 years ago. And it's a really, really awesome feeling to know that these rhino are going to be the basis of what uh, is going to become a prosperous and, 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 and really wonderful population of rhino in Rwanda. The translocation achieves a dual purpose. It keeps Pinda's remaining rhino population young, productive and genetically diverse while expanding the species range in a new country. Akagira's population could ultimately restock new areas in the future. In this respect and many others, Akagira's story is not dissimilar to Pinda's. Akagera is in the eastern province of Rwanda along the border of Tanzania. It's uh, Rwanda's last remaining protected savanna habitat and also Central Africa's largest wetland. So African Parks joined with the Rwandan Development Board to co-manage the park in 2010, trying to build up the, the reconstruction of the ecosystem following many years of human encroachment um, and poaching. So their first mandate was to join with RDB to create more infrastructure in the park, secure law enforcement, and engage with the community as a way of conserving the landscape and then further building up research and tourism after that. We can now say that Akagera is big five, um, following the reintroduction of lions and black rhinos and adding white rhinos is, is a very visible rhino to have in the park. Um, so there's a massive economic implication in terms of attracting tourism. And most importantly, it brings in tourism dollars, but then most of that is trickling back into communities and directly into conservation. People are always fundamental to the conservation equation. As demonstrated by Pinda's long-standing partnerships with their communities that co-own the land and wildlife of Pinda. But just as conservation cannot thrive without community involvement, operations like this one are likely to fail without collaboration between like-minded entities. One of the most remarkable things about any major international operation is it takes big teams of people to put it together and the future of conservation is going to depend on collaboration. It's never going to happen by any individual organization. It's not going to save the world. We have to work together. And this particular operation has been remarkable in that it's, it's donors, it's African parks, it's capture operators in conservation solutions, it's private sector rhino operations like the Pinda project, and all of those operations working together for a conservation outcome, which is starting a new population of rhinos in Akagera National Park and the relationships and the partnerships that are growing as, as conservation starts understanding that we have to work together for a long-term conservation outcome. That's going to be probably the biggest single learning from the difficult times that we've had now during COVID. And it's probably going to be the cornerstone of the future of conservation development. It's going to be how well we can work together. So we've got, we've obviously got a, a really experienced crew. Um, you know, the, the team that we're working with, the pilots, the vets, uh, the capture individuals, Grant, Grant and Kester and their, and their team uh, are, I would say, probably the best in the world um, for catching rhinos and moving rhinos. It's, it's, a, it's a big operation, there's a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of stress on the animals, and so it's very important to work with a team that, that has a lot of experience. Over the years, when works with a rhino, um, you, you take more and more, uh, or you translocate more and more in one go, you start realizing all the things that can possibly go wrong. Um, now that makes you nervous, but on the other hand, if you can predict what may possibly go wrong, you can make allowances for it. So when you say 30, the, from then on, you know, it's butterflies, and you've got to start thinking, okay, what happens if this happens? What happens if that happens? And I think what really helped in this particular instance were the people that I was working with. We relocated Rhino together for many years. It's total trust, and, uh, you know, our, the, the efficiency and proficiency is, is sort of totally above board. With a world-class team and an epic plan in place, this historical undertaking is set in motion.
A viable founder population of rhinos requires a mix of larger breeding bulls, cows with calves, and three to four-year-old animals that are able to handle the move and live out their whole lives in the new location. We, we worked out exactly how many white rhinos you can fit in a Boeing 747. We went one step backwards, then designed the boxes to fit in the plane, jumped one step further back from there, and then went and caught individual animals to fit the crates. So we've got our team collected. We have a helicopter here, um, veterinarian, and we've got a whole lot of crane trucks and empty crates, which we now need to go and fill in the bush. So uh, the challenge one is to find them. And then once we found them, we need to dart them and then of course try and get them down onto the ground. So once the animal's darted, it takes about five or six uh, minutes normally to get them down. Um, we obviously need to watch the breathing because they're going to respiratory depression quickly. So we, we partially antagonize the, the mobilizing drug that we, that we use just to get their breathing up. Yeah, so we've got a rope on the front just to just to guide her. Um, the crate, as you can see, is about sort of 50 meters from here. And then we need to get the truck to the to the crate. We then use a cattle prodder. We get it to walk. It stands up and walk it like you would a horse. So it's blindfolded around the eyes. We put some earplugs in the in the ears. Put some people in each side, and we we walk it and guide it into to an actual crate get them in the crate and a big hydraulic crane then lifts it and puts it on the back of a flatbed truck. And once it's on there, we then go back to the holding pens, do the reverse process. We lift it, put it down on the floor, open the door and let it out. Veterinary regulations require that the rhinos are kept in special quarantine camps for 45 days before they are moved. But this period is also critical to boost their body condition by supplementing their diet with lucernin pellets before the long journey. Tracking transmitters are also fitted during their stay in the BOMAs to enable Akagura field staff to monitor them once they are released. Ten rhinos each are grouped in three camps. These clusters of animals will travel together and will be released together. Today is the day where we're gonna have to load these rhinos. Um, they've been in the bomber for over a month or two, and now it's the day where we need to load them into the crate and then they're gonna be taken to Devon. But in terms of um, their healthiness, um, they, the state vets, gave us a thumbs up about two or three weeks ago when we were just doing some horn implants on them. So there hasn't been any rhinos that uh, got affected into the bombers, started getting sick, started losing body conditions and everything like that. They are very relieved. Uh, I think this was going to be the trickiest uh, part of the project with the most variables and uh, it's just gone, it's gone really perfectly. It's gone, we couldn't have asked for better uh, conditions, whether 30 rhinos is a lot of rhinos to, to remove out of this population, but myself and my team are incredibly proud of what's happening here today. I think it's a huge conservation success story. So we've just done the most amazing feat. We've uh, immobilized and loaded 30 rhinos in two and a half hours. We've had a massive team here at Pinda. Uh, we've ticked the first box, but now we've got a long journey and then we expect it in Durban at about two or three in the morning to start palletizing the crates so that we can load them onto the aeroplane sometime at about lunchtime tomorrow. We, uh, we're working against the clock the whole time because it's all about time for the rhinos. They can only be in the boxes for a certain amount of time. And uh, obviously the welfare of the animals is paramount to us. We need to make sure that they're okay. And then uh, we need to keep the animals tranquilized and quiet on the journey. And we have a window of 36 to 40 hours to get them there, get them offloaded in their pens and get them rehydrated and eating. There's a lot of things to worry about on the journey. Um, obviously, we're worried about the safety of the rhinos themselves. We do have nine uh, armed security guards traveling with us. It is 24 hours since the trucks departed Pinda and 30 hours since the first dart hit. A team of six exhausted specialists eventually board the Boeing. 
to escort the 30 VIP passengers to Rwanda. The flight to Kigali and road transfer from there will take the overall traveling time to just on 40 hours in the end. But nothing short of giant measures could hope to produce the giant outcomes at stake here. A new founder population of white rhino for East Africa. The story of Pinda has come full circle in 30 years. From less than 30 rhinos at Pinda's inception to having 30 surplus animals available to donate to another reserve is an undeniable conservation triumph. From a conservation perspective, one of the most remarkable um, opportunities that we have is to rewild destinations that have lost species over time. And when you've got proper management at a park and you're able to then reintroduce all of the species that used to exist to get back to your biodiversity levels, that's the most satisfying part of conservation and most important. The rhinos are under siege. We're losing must be nearly 10% of our rhino population every year, which is, which is critical, you know. I mean, the species could be gone in 10 or 15 years. So to know that we, we're moving these animals to an ex-situ population, a new range state, you might actually be making a difference to the species long term, you know. Who knows 20 years from now what, is, what, is, uh, what the outcome is going to be. This project's been a, a few years in the pipeline. Uh, it's never been done before and I think that's the significance of this is it's a truly an historic event. It's also shown what's possible with the collaboration of unique individuals and like-minded partners. The work that's been doing here in Akagera National Park is very, very similar to what happened 30 years ago at, at and beyond Pinda. You know, it was taking sort of land that was really destined for nothing and there was a vision there to bring wildlife back to develop and protect wildlife and obviously the communities that surround it.